formation for Auburn. And here comes Bo Jackson looking for daylight. And two Aggies bring him down near the 20 yard line. The last two times out, formation wise, Auburn was in an unbalanced line. They're taking the left tackle, Wallace, bringing him over, putting him beside Searles, their right tackle, so that they have three big men along with Middleton, number 87, when they put him in there. And they're going to try to create a power base there. Uh, the pass was off the same formation, but of course they did not block it. Third and 17, Washington has not been a consistent passer this year. Single setback, Washington under pressure, and he is brought down at the 16-yard line. And that was Ron Sadler, a defensive end, and he's a big-time player, number 99. He'll be a star in the NFL someday. one-time walk-on at Auburn, Lewis Colbert, and an All-American punter, standing near his two-yard line. His first punt. Wow. Jimmy Hawkins going way back inside the 25-yard line. Trying to get outside and turn up field, and he steps out of bounds at the 27-yard line. So that's what Texas A&M will have possession. So in this 50th Cotton Bowl Classic, Auburn leads Texas A&M 7-0. We'll be right back. At the Wall Street Journal, we believe that building a dream takes more than luck and hard work. It takes a vision, a vision of what tomorrow holds today. At the Journal, we've been giving people that vision for over 90 years. The Wall Street Journal, the daily diary of the American dream. As loyal bud drinkers, we have over the years consumed 88,008 cans of the King of Beers. So when Old Style said it was better brewed than Bud, we were skeptical. Wires, I said. But we tried Old Style and found we had made 88,008 mistakes. We are now trying to make up for that. How are we doing, Curtis? That's 10 so far. Well, only 87,998 <laughs> more to go. Eileman's Old Style, America's best brewed premium beer. Saturday, the Cowboys visit the Rams. Sunday, the Giants tackle the Big Bad Bears. The NFC Playoffs on CBS Sports. Lewis Colbert just showed us why he's an All-American. 61 yards. He's a very special story here today. And for that, let's go down to Jim Nance. Jim? Thank you, Brett. Lewis Colbert had to come overcome tremendous adversity. He was born with a club foot, had an operation before high school. Doctors told him not to play football, but he went out for his high school team anyway. Then he walked on at Auburn, still wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream of playing college football. His second year, Pat Dye gave him a scholarship after such a tremendous effort his freshman year at Auburn. Pat Dye told me this week it was the happiest, one of the happiest days of his coaching career, the day he gave Lewis Colbert a well-deserved scholarship here at Auburn. 61 yards, a good start for him. Let's go back upstairs with Brent. All right, Jim, thank you. The eyes of Kevin Murray. He now steps under the gun. Trailing by seven. He'll try to rally the Aggies. He pitches, and that is to Tony, who gets out at the 35-yard line. That was, check that, that was Keith Woodside, number 33. Let's take a look at Woodside. Now, he's one of their quicker backs as they continue to rotate. He has the ability to break one here this afternoon. Tony, 25, leading this play, and Woodside cuts off the block up inside where there was a seam. It'll be second and two for the Aggies. From the eye, and the short man, Tony, goes right straight ahead, and he is met by linebacker Edward Phillips. Era, when you brought Notre Dame down here for those two Cotton Bowls, how was the weather? Well, we had uh, horrible weather the first game, Brent, it had rained. This was not a synthetic surface field, it was a natural grass field. They brought helicopters in and tried to beat the water off, and they put sawdust. It was not a good field. The second time we came back, we had a great field, the uh, artificial surface, and we had a fast field, even though it was cold. Fast track today. Murray to throw again, right over the middle. Complete to Bernstein, and the tight end 
who busts across midfield down to the 47-yard line. That's a 16-yard gain, and the Aggies have got the offense rolling here for the first time. Now this is the multiple aspect of this Texas A&M team. Tight end Bernstein. Right in there, they put four receivers out. The fifth goes on out from the fullback spot. The linebackers have dropped off, and you can see Bernstein wide open. Murray hits him. On first down, the handoff is to Tony. Eric, you mentioned that big right tackle, number 75, Doug Williams of the Aggies. He played at Moeller High School, then he went to Kentucky, and he transferred to College Station, and Williams is almost a certain number one draft choice by the NFL. When the Aggies need one, two, or three yards today, look for them to run up behind big number 75. Second down, in motion. Murray straight back quickly. Bernstein was open, but he can't get it off in time. Carriker comes through on the blitz from his linebacking spot. This is very unusual for the Auburn team. They don't do a whole lot of blitzing, but that time, character number 47, did a great job. Take it right from ground level. You see Murray coming back into the pocket. And watch character number 47 right there. Put the pressure on it as he blitzes from that weak linebacker spot. Great job by character. Era so far. The Auburn Tigers have made all the big plays in this game. And that is character's first sack of the year. Drop a slow pass, and it was not a well-thrown ball. He got the pass in front of Tony. He overled him. It was a perfect screen set up. Murray hit him. They had, a, had all the blockers out there. They had a good play set up, but Murray didn't quite get it to him. He has started one of four for 16 yards. And sometimes it is difficult for a quarterback to shake out of a bad start. It can make it an uphill battle all game long. Well, that sack really put him in a negative position. Chance punting for the second time. It's a low punt. Gainis runs up and fumbles the ball. Texas A&M recovers. Monty J was downfield on that specialty team, and number 51 scooped it up, and the Aggies get a turnover. consistent players. He comes up to try to field the ball. He didn't the last time. It's a tough catch. You see the ball hits his left knee, and he can't field it. It bounces forward, and of course, this is a quick break for the A&M team. Kevin Murray asking for a little quiet. Hands off to Vick, who is back in at fullback. That's Roger Vick, who's 6'3", 218, only a junior out of Tomball, Texas. And Tracy Rocker brought him down for Auburn. See, the principle of the offense, as you see, they open it up one back in the back. If they deploy, Auburn deploys out to stop the pass. They'll give the ball to the fullback and try to get that four and five yards. If they keep the linebackers in there, then they go to their four and five receivers. It's a very tough attack to defend. Nelson in motion. And instead, they will run right straight ahead with Vic again. Trying to wear down the middle of that Auburn defense. Coming up this weekend, of course, a big one in the NFL, isn't it? The divisional playoffs, and on CBS, we will bring you the Dallas Cowboys out of Anaheim to play the Los Angeles Rams. We'll start at 3.30 Eastern time. And then on Sunday, it'll be the Giants and the Bears, 12 noon from Soldier Field. Third and three, Murray to put it up for the fifth time, complete. He hits Walker with a sideline pass for a first down, well-thrown ball. Well, the Auburn team was out of character that time. They went to a man-to-man -man coverage. They really were playing too far off their defenders. They put a blitz on by the linebackers. Watch the linebackers come. You see, they're almost a goal-line defense. Here come the linebackers delayed. But the secondary is too far off. You can see right here, number 45, who is Jimmy Warren, is way too far off as you can see. Them. And that gives the Aggies a first down at the 15. Now they'll run pick straight ahead. He gets near the 10-yard line on first down. Jackie Sherrill watching and 
era, that completion by Murray can do wonders for him because he was off to a shaky start throwing the ball. Well, you know, he came into the season with all, I'm into this game with almost a 60% average, so you know, somewhere along the line, he's going to start hitting them. Although, quarterbacks can have bad days like everybody else. On second down, again, he has Nelson in motion, and this time they pitch to Johnson. Johnson breaks free. Great second effort on into the end zone. is a six foot 188 pound freshman i mean this is real effort look at the lineman up there let's see who misses i can't quite see had a pretty good shot at him and johnson ran right on through for the touchdown great piece of running let's take one more look murray on the toss to johnson he slips into the seam he should have been brought down by powell he couldn't get over in time to help out and then breaking free Johnson gets on in. And what happens when you score a touchdown and you're an Aggie fan? Well, there's the replay. That's tradition. Boy, if you go to Texas A&M, you got to hope your team scores about 50 a game, don't you? We'll be right back. Aggie! Competition. It's what makes American business go. It's what makes American business excel. Competition. It's what gives meaning to success. Competition. It's what drives Hilton to be America's business address. For over a hundred years, Metropolitan Life has been known for leadership in the field of life insurance. But there's a lot more to MetLife than that. Met is also health insurance auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, and retirement plans. No matter what kind of insurance protection you need, all you have to remember is this face and the name Metropolitan Life. Get met. It pays. See America's top Grand Prix riders in a unique team competition at the Mercedes Horse Jumping Championship, Sunday on CBS Sports. We are back, and now we are going to show you one of those marvelous traditions at Texas A&M. Started only in 1983 by Jackie Sherrill, the 12th men. Outside of the kicker, you are looking at 10 non-scholarship athletes at Texas A&M. They come down only on kickoff coverage. Now, with the 12th man, you can see the enormous difference. No one has ever returned a kickoff for a touchdown against these non-scholarship students. The longest return is 29 yards, and there is an Auburn return man who is determined to do something about it. His name is Brent Fullwood. He's number 22. He's standing back at the two. The 12th man is ready to set sail again for Jackie Sherrill. to strut their stuff right now. It'll be first down on the 20-yard line. Era, what a simply grand tradition that was, but if you were a head coach and someone had suggested invite all the walk-ons at Notre Dame to come out and we'll use them for kickoff coverage, what would you have said? Why, absolutely. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think of the idea. <laughs> In the Fiesta Bowl, over in Tempe, 
Nebraska leading Michigan 7-3. Yesterday was a bad day for the Big Ten. Both Illinois and Michigan State beaten in bowl games. Reggie Ware now in at fullback and again on first down. Washington looking to pass and again it's John Roper, the linebacker, who takes him down. His second sack. Auburn is trying to loosen up the Texas A&M defense, but they cannot protect. Here comes Roper again. This is just a sprint out. Looks like he wants to throw back. But here's Roper taking the inside on a stunt. Brings Washington down. And not a very good way to set up a passing attack. So the third sack overall by the A&M. Second by Roper. Tommy Agee back in at fullback in front of Bo Jackson. It's Jackson. And they gang up on him. And there's a penalty marker thrown. Penalty marker is down. Running forward, tossing it. Sammy O'Brien, the outstanding nose guard, held the middle. And Ben Tamborello, who is an outstanding center, All-American. You watch right here as he goes against O'Brien, who is 6'3", 244. He comes off the block, sliding down the line, and does a good job on him. He played an outstanding game against the University of Texas. Well, it was our first penalty of this Cotton Bowl game. this call is a face mask on the defense still second down a face mask penalty by our officials who many of whom are out of the big eight conference here this afternoon in this cotton bowl our referee sam mapis the umpire is bob holiday and it was kent Hout who threw the flag that time and the rest of our officials who are working here this afternoon Play is in for Auburn, sent in for the sideline. Trey Gaines split wide to the bottom of your screen, not in your picture right now. And on this second down, Bo Jackson is short of the 25-yard line. And this weekend, Era will be live from Anaheim. Jimmy the Greek and Irv Cross will be there. We'll take a look at John Robinson's Rams, and of course we'll be checking both teams right up to kickoff. 3.30 Eastern Time, Saturday afternoon from Anaheim. The Tigers pumped up, isn't he? Here is a third down for Washington and Auburn. Washington to throw. It was intended for Gaines, incomplete. Domingo Bryant, number six, claiming that he got the ball. He is a big play defensive back. Let's take a look at Bryant. Domingo has got seven sacks, so he's really a great player. They're doing some stunning on the inside. Let's see what happens right at this. Looks like the ball was there, but Domingo thought he took it away from him. The ball must have hit the ground. Cannot see it from that angle. Colbert's second punt for Auburn. Remember, his first one was 61 yards. Hawkins fields it near the 30. And he is down at the 37-yard line. Sean Morris down to make the tackle. That was a 46-yard punt and a 6-yard return. 7-6, Auburn leading, Texas A&M missing an extra point. Turnovers have set up both touchdowns here this afternoon in this Cotton Bowl. And Kevin Murray and the Aggies go back to work. And the running backs, Anthony Tony, 25, and Keith Woodside, 33. They have been shuttling backs. Tony is set behind Murray, who will throw on first down, right over the middle, complete the Bernstein. Era, I did not expect to see the tight end featured this much for Texas A&M, and that was a gain of 22 yards. And I'm sure that's exactly what Auburn thought, because they have not featured him, but you'll see the two linebackers run out, and right in the middle, Bernstein, right in the seam. Nobody there, and he turns and runs that ball right up the field. Great, great offensive play by Texas A&M. Nelson coming in motion, and they run Tony straight ahead to the 36-yard line up the middle. A 
multiple set offensive attack by Jackie Sherrill. Auburn's in a little bit of a dilemma now, I think, Brent, because they got burned in their man-to-man -man coverage and are not able to contain uh, Murray and the Texas A&M offense, passing game, I should say, in a pure zone. So they're going to have to do some other things, I think, with their linebackers. Second and four for Cheryl's Aggies. Nelson coming in motion, off the play fake. Murray looking for all of it, and Nelson, who trips down at the five, there is no interference called on the play. He simply got his feet tangled up. Kevin Porter had coverage for Auburn, number three. Kevin Porter did a fine job, an excellent job in his coverage that time. He was right on him, played the ball well. Take another look. This is Nelson coming down the right sideline. You'll see Murray lock that ball up just before he got hit. But you'll see Porter in beautiful position, excellent position. We take another look at it in era against the Longhorns. It was a shorter pass play, and Nelson made the catch for a touchdown. Murray comes back to Walker, complete inside the 25-yard line. A first down for the Aggies, and Thomas was there on the coverage for Auburn. Beautiful timing on that play, Brent. The ball was thrown by Murray just as Walker put a move upfield and then turned and came back, and the ball was right there, almost impossible to defend. Injured player on the field, and that is Harold Holman, their talented nose guard. And that would be a blow to the middle of that Auburn defense right now. Harold, let's talk for a minute about Kevin Murray. I know a lot of folks do not know that Murray was a minor league baseball player in the Milwaukee Brewers organization. And you and I spoke to him yesterday about a young pitcher that he faced a couple of times, Dwight Gooden. What did he tell you about that experience? What was it he said? He says he came three times in a row, was it? <laughs> said my second time out, he struck me out three times and I became a quarterback quicker. <laughs> and there's another baseball player on the field, Bo Jackson. And I asked him his feelings about his last game for Auburn here today in the Cotton Bowl. I, I, well, I said, hey, this is my last game, and I'm just trying to go out with a big bang, whether I win or lose. It's my final college game playing for Auburn, and I just want to come out and have, have uh, fun to try to help my team win the fourth straight bowl game. You'll need help for the defense. Woodside is open. Touchdown, Texas a and Jackson, he'll need to get Auburn another touchdown, a 22-yard run. And Doug Williams, 75, made another big block for Jackie Sherrill. does a nice job of running his second touchdown of the afternoon. Now the two-point attempt, and Kevin Murray knew that he overthrew this ball just a bit. This is one of the favorite patterns at AM. Run to the corner, and it's just a touch high. Nelson extending, and he can't quite get it. So they have missed both extra point opportunities here, and they will stand at 12-7, and we will get another look at the 12th man versus Brent Fullwood of Auburn. Again, 10 non-scholarship students, all of whom are out of the state of Texas, and they are riled up Aggie fans right now.
gets out to the 33-yard line before Kyle Collins and Sean Morris. So Morris was bringing it back. And again, it was Danny Balker, number two, who tackled him. Ball bobbling around like this throws off the timing, but you can see the crease opens up right there, and he pops through. The saving tackle right there. It's still a pretty good field position for Auburn Tigers. Pat died telling us yesterday, I really want to bust one against the 12th man. He had an alley that time. Didn't he? Here comes Bo Jackson on first down. One of the things that any defense has to watch out for against Bo Jackson is that ability to cut back if you over pursue. If you are so diligent in trying to cut him off, he'll take you back the other way. Well, what happened there, Domingo, Domingo Bryant puts from that side and forced Jackson back to the inside. This is the, the defensive plan that they had. It didn't work well that time. Auburn has been held to 15 yards rushing so far. It is second down from the eye. Jackson, and he is stacked up right away. Nowhere to go, and again it is John Roper, the linebacker, number 83, who is playing an outstanding game here so far for the Aggies. Doing some stunning with Roper. The tackle will step outside, and Roper will come back inside as an outside linebacker, and they're causing confusion for the Auburn blockers. You see Pat Dye's concerned. See what his offensive coaching staff comes up here. It is third and eight. Washington straight back with good protection, good time, and there is a penalty marker down. Trey Gaines was down at the 45-yard line, and there was a penalty marker thrown on the play. James Flowers was the defensive back working against Gaines. I think they're going to call interference. Hold it. What is it? Was tip, he was going. I think he had the microphone on for a moment when he wanted well, it off, but then they got right. into a little bit of a discussion and now they're calling everybody over here. They called pot pass interference, but the ball was tipped and it makes it legal then. The ball was tipped. Disregard the flag. Good call, Coach. Yep. That's what happened on it. There was contact that was made. As the ball is tipped, then you're free access to the receivers. You can make contact. And you'll see right here, the ball is tipped. And then, of course, the receiver was hit just in the process, right there. Era, the man who tipped it was Todd Howard. And Flowers was the man that made the contact with the receiver. Colbert to punt again. This will be his third punt. And we will have to wait for a time. Timeout has been called. There were only 10 Auburn players on the field. Now the 11th man, number 41, jogs on into his position. And I'm sure Coach Dye is going to have a word or two for whoever is the coach of the punt team because that cost them a vital first down. Texas A&M scoring its second touchdown in this game to take the 12-7 lead and watch Tony lead the way 25 and Woodside following in behind his devastating block then made the cutback and went the distance for the touchdown. A&M tried for two points and failed because they had missed an earlier kick but they lead Auburn 12 to 7. The Tigers scoring first in this game after a fumble by the Aggies at their own 20 yard line. Total yards era and it's really lopsided. It really is. Auburn with 12 yards, A&M with 121. And here is Colbert hunting for the third time for Coach Dunn. We'll let this one go out of bounds. So Colbert wanted something a little bit straighter than what he got off that time. There is a flag down. That's what Colbert was pointing at. It is down near midfield. 
Now that is only a 35-yard punt. Hook holding on Texas a &M. Era, you and I have been in Dallas. And to talk about the Cowboys and the Rams, what do you think about that matchup on Saturday? Well, it's going to be a very interesting game. I know that uh, a lot of the folks think that uh, Dallas has been a little inconsistent. You never know when they're going to play real well, but you can't discount that operation in Tom Landry. And then, of course, on Sunday, it's the Bears and the Giants, 1963, Wrigley Field, the last time they met in a playoff game in Chicago. Oh, it was cold that afternoon. I hope it's warmer up there this weekend. Can the Bears win that ball game? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask anybody from Chicago, and they'll tell you. Jerry Fontenot is now in centering for Texas A&M. Johnson and Vick are the running backs, and this is Roger Vick muscling through on first down. After the penalty, the ball was put down at the 18-yard line on that first down, and then Vick ran it out just beyond the 23. Time remaining in our first quarter here, and this is the 50th Cotton Bowl Classic. those offenses that can lull you to sleep running off tackle off tackle off tackle and then Murray can hit you with about a 30-yard pass play. Well Jackie Sherrill brought in Lynn Amity uh, who was the architect of the Vanderbilt offense they did a lot of things oh we've got an injury down here. Auburn player is down. Williams is down for Auburn. Well, he is, uh, he's their best down lineman, Gerald Williams. Being tended to there by the trainers. So we're coming to the end of the first quarter. Pat Dye and the Auburn Tigers scoring first, but they're trailing. And there have been so many great moments down here in the... 50 years of Cotton Bowl history, and of course, no one is better equipped to tell that story than Lindsey Nelson. And Lindsey will be here at halftime, and we'll take a look at the Cotton Bowl's pass. First down on that run, the short man, it is Vic, and he is met at the point of attack. Tracy Rocker, number 74, was the first Auburn Tiger to get a lick at it. some of the contact that we're seeing right here. A little of that hand-to-hand -hand warfare, if you will, that goes on between blocker and defender trying to get free. It was Andre Bruce, number 93, who was a freshman. But Pat Dyes is really high on him. He thinks he's going to be a fine player. We come to the end of the first quarter. 12-7, Texas A&M. We'll return after this commercial and a word from your local station. A&M leading after one quarter, 12-7. The Aggies made some headlines off the field a little bit earlier, and for that story, let's get down to Jim Nance. Brent, it's been kind of a rough year, actually, for the Southwest Conference when it comes to being placed on probation. And in the last month, there have been allegations in a Dallas newspaper, plus one Dallas television station, about uh, irregularities in the, in the Texas A&M recruiting. But Jackie Sherrill, before this game, was concerned how this might affect his players. He told them not to worry about this, do not talk to the media about it. I will handle it. I talked to several players. They said, actually, it's been a very positive thing for them. It's helped bond them together, made them a closer unit, and that was very evident here in the first quarter. Let's go back upstairs. All right, Jim, and at halftime, I will ask Coach Sherrill if they pay football players at Texas A&M. That's coming up at halftime. We start the second quarter. It is second and ten. Kevin Murray off a of play fake, drops straight back, complete again to Bernstein, the tight end. Era again, Murray is finding his tight end underneath. 
Well, he's continuing on with his season average. He's had a great year. He's the key figure in that offense. But again, I want to say something about Lynn Amity, who has really been the architect of this offensive football team, and they really are explosive. And Auburn not so explosive in the first quarter. They run Vic right straight ahead, and he busts across midfield. Gerald Robinson and Tom Powell making the tackle. You've got Auburn completely off balance. They don't know whether to play the pass or the run. They're doing a great job. Watch the left guard. You see him cut right behind it. Right there. Great block right there on Robinson, number 95, by Randy Wild. And Vic again up the middle, this time inside the 40-yard line. Gerald Williams, who was not seriously injured, fortunately, making the stop for Auburn. Jackie Sherrill's Aggies have been dominating this game ever since an early turnover. And on that scoring drive for Auburn, they completed their only pass, and it was their first offensive play of the game. They have been shut down ever since. And another first down for Texas A&M. Playing in its first Cotton Bowl since 1968. And Pat Dye and Auburn playing in their first Cotton Bowl. Nebraska beating Michigan 14-3. to That's somewhat surprising against that Michigan defense that we saw all year long ago. Really is the foe has had trouble in bowl games. First down, Murray back under pressure. Now he'll keep it, and he's safe at second base there at the 35-yard line. <laughs> Very wisely gets down to the turf. Wants to come back to throw some more passes. Cheryl will have him back next season, too. He broke his ankle last year in a game against Arkansas State. He was redshirted and very despondent. He did some rehabilitation work at the Dallas Cowboys training facility. Right out of Dallas here. Second down, bringing Harris in motion. On the pitch, it's Harry Johnson. Driven out of bounds, short of the 30-yard line. Edward Phillips, 46, was the defensive player who got him out. Well, after a shaky start era, there is no question but that Kevin Murray possesses a great deal of skill. They've looked like a machine on the last two, two drives that they've had. They've really got Auburn off balance needs a big play somewhere along the line. This third down play. Complete. And it's a first down and you know who. Rod Bernstein, the tight end. They tried to blitz again. Single coverage. Powell could not stay with him. The free safety of Auburn. And you'll see it right here as he cuts across right in front of the screen. Murray comes back. Watch Powell, number nine, trying to stay with him, and he can't. And Bernstein's got the lead. He shakes both tacklers, and 45, Jimmy Warren finally gets him down. Four catches for 63 yards for Bernstein, handing off to Tony, who has checked in. Pat Thomas, number 41, with the tackle for Auburn. When you play in Auburn, Alabama, or College Station, Texas, and you start the season late August, early September, you need a lot of players, especially at that running back position. And Texas A&M will alternate up to six running backs against Auburn here this afternoon. Texas A&M coaches, the offensive coaches, were telling me they feel that they can get six yards passing virtually any time. From the coach's perspective, Johnson and another Johnson this one Arthur number 40 and on the tackle for Pat Dye and Auburn he is the strong safety in that secondary and this defense has been under a great deal of pressure from the Aggies here let's see what Auburn decides to do defensively on this play I think they should just go right on the goal line defense they're having trouble stopping them third down they need to stop them some way 
It's third and four. They'd love to force a field goal attempt here if they can. And they will run, and they've stopped them short of that first down. Johnson not getting it. Gerald Williams, 98, and also Benji Rowland, number 96. He's going to go with a field goal. He wants that 15th point on the board if he can get it because it requires three scores. Or if you want to go for a two-point play, it would require two two-point plays. Franklin missed an extra point at the opposite end earlier in the game. Now he has that 10-mile-an-hour wind at his back attempting this field goal. He's at the left hash mark. He's only 15 for 27 on field goals. He missed a couple of chip shots in one of the key games, the SMU game. Missing again, a 25-yarder. Oh, the life of a field goal specialist. He's had a tough year. His brother, meanwhile, coming off that record-tying performance with the New England Patriots last week against the New York Jets, and now the younger Franklin having difficulty here in the Cotton Bowl. We'll be right back. Jackson and Auburn coming back to work. They have thrown a lot on first down. Let's see if they get out of that pattern. This time, they toss the ball to Jackson. He slips outside, turns, and gets to the 27-yard line. And Larry Kelm, 65, the leading tackler, was one of the first Aggies to hit him there. That was that formation where they bring Wallace over with Searles, the two tackles to, to, to the right, and then they use Middleton, who is really a tight end, as the flanker back, and they tried to run off that tackle. Domingo Bryant was blitzing on the left side, and Jackson actually ran outside of him. Reggie Ware, 36, in at fullback behind Washington. They hand to Ware. He's a powerful young man, getting close to the first down. Sammy O'Brien, the nose guard number 90, who just simply dominated the middle against the Texas Longhorns in that game that the Aggies had to win, comes up with that big stop. The difference is offensively. The Aggies have dominated. And you know, when you think about bowl games, Era, I've always noticed that the team that can pass really gets the upper hand in a bowl game. Well, as we pointed out at the top of the telecast, it's the balance of the Texas team. Their ability to run and pass equally well is certainly an advantage. Only the second first down for Auburn in this game. Washington to throw again on first down, has time, couldn't get an open receiver. Now he's on the move and he's down at the 32-yard line. And Johnny Holland, number 11, the All-American linebacker, was giving pursuit over there on that side. That's the first time that we have called his name here this afternoon. And he's a good one. You can see him checking over at the sideline. He'll take the defensive call from the Aggie bench, and then he will pass it on in the huddle. There was only one poster up over in the A&M locker room in College Station, Texas, when I visited, and that was a poster of one Bo Jackson, who was stripped down to his football pants and ready to go to work, and Johnny Holland said, boy, I wish I had a body like that. <laughs> Second down and eight. Washington is sacked and taken down by Jay Muller. That's the fourth sack by the Aggies of Washington here this afternoon. I guess they're trying to establish a passing game, but they cannot get the protection, and Pat Washington is hesitant. He's afraid to throw the ball. He's afraid he's gonna throw an interception. Of course, he hasn't, didn't have a whole lot of time there, but they just are having a great deal of difficulty trying to establish a passing game. Third and 13, so you would expect them to try again against that waiting and tough Jackie Sherrill defense. Washington, great right back, blitz by Bryant, they drop it off to Bo Jackson. 35, 40, 45, 50, here he comes. 40, 35, they won't catch him, forget it. Bo Jackson for the touchdown. Number one. 
you have just seen why NFL scouts are drooling all across the land. 73 yards on a pass from Washington. Auburn will go for two. Stop short. That was Brent Fullwood, 22, carrying the ball into the heart of that Aggie defense. You and I spoke about the Auburn attack all week long. We said the one thing they should do is drop the pass to Bo Jackson. He's such a great receiver, a great baseball player. Exactly what they do here is fifth reception of the year, and he goes 73 yards with it. Once he gets into the open, there's no one that can catch Bo Jackson. 4.22 in the 40. You can see no one in sight. Great play. And that's his point you pointed out is why he is the Heisman Trophy winner and everybody wants him in professional football. He will also play baseball for Auburn as a senior. He has been drafted by the New York Yankees and later by the California Angels. The Angels offering him a quarter of a million dollars. Baseball will have to wait, however. The NFL scouts are after him, too. specialty team. You know, there are a lot of folks have asked me, why is he named Bo? Well, let's find out. Let's go back downstairs to Jimmy. Well, Brent, his real name is Vincent Edward Jackson. But you see, when he was in the sixth grade, his friend said that he was as mean as a boar hog. Eventually, the hog was dropped and boar was shortened to Bo. That's how you got Bo Jackson. One thing's for sure, you can call him Bo or you can call him Vincent. But he's one incredible athlete, Mr. Jackson. He's made one name for himself. Let's go back upstairs. All right, Jeff, thank you. Now it is the Aggies turn it back. Kevin Murray pulling out on first down. Complete at the 30-yard line. He hits Shea Walker. Boy, he hummed that one in there. Murray put some zip on that ball. Well, Mr. Jackson has seized the spotlight away from young Mr. Murray. And now our other baseball player is coming back. setback. That's Roger Vick. Coming out near the 33-yard line. Well, let's reset the scene here in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas. You can see there's a penalty flag down there, and they will show us the holding sign. It is the Auburn Tigers. And they like that penalty going against Texas A&M at this moment. Bo Jackson scored his first touchdown on a five-yard run. It was 7-0 after the extra point. Texas A&M scored, and it was Johnson from 11 yards out. They missed the extra point kick. But then they took the lead as Woodside ran 22 yards. They went for two points, and that failed. It was 12-7. And moments ago, Washington dumping one off to Jackson, who took it 73 yards for the touchdown. Auburn went for two. They missed, and we're sitting on a one-point Cotton Bowl, 13-12, 7.56 to go, with Nebraska leading Michigan at the half in the Fiesta Bowl, 14-3. Now, after the penalty, they'll run the draw play with Vic, and he busts one tackle, but not two more. The first man to hit him was Brian Smith. He slowed him up enough, and then help came from his friends. A&M has the kind of football team that can overcome penalties like this. It's not easily done, obviously, but Murray has the arm. They have the personal attack to be able to do so, and they have two more downs to try to get it done. This is second and 21 for Murray and the Aggies. Murray is 7 of 11 for 104 yards. Here's his 12th pass. Bobbled, and the receiver goes back for the ball to hold on was Tony Thompson, number 80. That's a 19-yard gain. 
Thompson's just a freshman. You see it from the end zone, Murray in the pocket. Watch him move around. Not only does he have a great arm, he's able to scramble, and he sees well. There's the ball right there to Thompson. He bobbles it momentarily, gathers it back. Nice job by Thompson. And you can see they have third and short. Well, they got 19 of those 21 with that pass. Single setback. Murray to throw. He wanted Nelson, and it's incomplete. He threw it into the ground. Down. I think he threw it into the ground. He was open. He was trying to get Nelson, but it looked like Murray got the ball on a too low a trajectory. Murray in the offense leave, and punter Todd Shantz on the field for the Aggies. Now Trey Gaines is set to return. He fumbled a punt, which led to an Aggie touchdown. This one he has at the 11, but he can't get anywhere. Alex Morris, number 30, who has been very visible on those specialty teams, comes down to make the stop. So we'll come back with Auburn leading Texas A&M by a point. 6.26 to go in the first half. You can see what he's accomplished filling in for Jackson. Remember that Bo has missed playing time because of injuries. He played that entire Alabama game with a couple of broken ribs. Told us yesterday that he is fine for this Cotton Bowl. And after that 73-yard touchdown, he'll sit out a series. Where is the fullback? And he runs right straight ahead and powers his way out to the 20-yard line. Now, both Ware and Fullwood are back for Coach Dye next season. However, Coach Dye will make a change with his offensive coordinator. It is a story that is known well around Auburn. And one of the men who may be added to Pat Dye's staff as a quarterback coach is up here working on the radio network for Auburn. Another Heisman Trophy winner, Pat Sullivan. Second down for Washington, who hands off to Fullwood. Fullwood running away from his blockers, gets to the corner on the outside, and Holland was in pursuit of him over there. Coach is not too happy over there on the sideline, Aaron. Well, I, I imagine he would like to maintain possession of that ball. He wanted a little bit of blocking on that side. He's got third down and short. The best way to stop the Texas A&M offense, which the Auburn Tigers have had difficulty with, is to maintain possession of the ball himself. Well, he's taking Fullwood out, and I think he wants to talk to him. I felt that Fullwood ran away from his blocker that time, and that there was something inside. Guy is speaking to him, and that means for the power eye, Bo Jackson is back in the field. They toss to Jackson. Jackson squeezes for what appears to be the first down. Todd Howard, 73 over there to bring him down. Good patience that time by Bo Jackson. He waited for the little blocking open. You'll see it here, right from the end zone. He's very patient here. He waits. Now when he finally sees it, he's going to be tackled. He thrusts forward and does a nice job on it. 73, Todd Howard is the man that brought him down. And he goes back out after getting Dye what he wanted, the first down. How the Heisman Trophy winner is doing. Fullwood is back in as the eye back. Ware is the fullback. And again, it is Ware into the middle of that Aggie defense. Out close to the 30. Dye obviously trying to take some time off that clock right now. They are down toward 520 here in the first half. You know, it's interesting that that touchdown pass that Jackson ran was only the second touchdown pass in the last 34 quarters in Auburn. So they just, they just haven't had that many touchdowns through the air. The Aggie defense waited. Middleton, the H-back, comes in motion. Washington toss, forward, can't find a handle, has it on the hop, and Domingo Bryant, number six, is up to bring him down. Just when I brag on forward, he dribbles one for me and can't find his blocker. Well, he got a favorable bounce for it to come right back. Otherwise, he could have been in real trouble. That Bryant is one of the big play defensive backs in college football this year. And also, very good job of defense on the option. This is the first option play that Auburn has run. The ball was thrown a little bit high, but you see the ball came right back to him. Excellent job of defense. Domingo Bryant, a great safety does a nice job. Boy, they're doing a good job of blocking on Holland, aren't they? On third down, Washington overthrows the intended target that time. Freddie Wagan, way over his head. 
before this game is over, I gotta have Bo Jackson throw the ball. <laughs> you know, but I want to double back on my thought. Johnny Holland, who has not been obvious. Now, the Auburn offense is certainly aware of him. And did you see him come back that time? Middleton, the tight end, he's gonna go in about the second or third round of the NFL draft. Now, Colbert to punt again. Gets one high. AM will let it bounce dead. Down at the 39 yard line. We got a 13 12 Cotton Bowl. Four minutes, first half. We'll be right back. Begin with raw steel. Shape it with fire, muscle, and sweat. Polish it to razor sharp perfection. We're looking for a few good men with a medal to be Marines. You know, I've been a beer drinker for a bunch of years. And like you, I've seen a lot of beer commercials. There's one beer that people loved before it was even advertised. You see, Coors was kind of the beer at my folks' place. People thought it was different, special. And that was true long before there were any jingles or promotions. It's the product people love, not the hoopla. You think about that. How many products can you say that about? Coors is the one. Texas A&M will have possession at the 40-yard line. The Aggies this year, 9-2. Their two losses were both on the road to Alabama and Baylor. As a matter of fact, some of those Alabama folks say, hey, we've already won the Cotton Bowl. We beat Texas A&M early and Auburn late. Alabama coming through with a good second half to win the Aloha Bowl. But, boy, did you see that game? How many penalties can you have in the first half, huh? First down now, Murray back to throw it for the Aggies. Drills one to the sideline, it's complete to Rod Harris, number 17. Another fine throw by Murray. Really impressed when he throws that sideline route and he has to get there, get it there in a hurry because the coverage is tight. He just drills it in there. 17-yard gain for Murray, who is 9 of 14 for 136 yards in the first half of this Cotton Bowl. And Harris, who is out of the Dallas, Texas area, Working that sideline pattern. Single running back is Anthony Tony. Battles his way inside the 45-yard line. Gerald Robinson, 95 of Auburn. In there to help out and bring him down. He's a fine defensive player, Robinson is. All conference in the Southeastern Conference and really high on him. Well, when I visited Auburn, it was a couple of weeks after the Alabama loss. Boy, did they take that loss tough down there. Oh, that, you know, that traditional rivalry down there, that was really something. Murray is back, quick pass deflected. The rushman getting to it that time and knocking it incomplete. Now it'll be third down for Texas A&M. When you think about it, after looking several times at the videotape of that Alabama game, if you're an Auburn fan, you have every right to think you had it won when you were inside of 50 minutes and you had Mike Shula and Ray Perkins and difficulty back there. Murray calling a timeout as he comes out of the huddle. 3.12 to go here in the first half. And Murray will come over and confer with Jackie Sherrill. So, Texas A&M is located in College Station, Texas, and so we have seen both campuses, and there is a certain similarity to the two schools. Auburn, living for many years in the shadow of Alabama, and Texas A&M having to put up with Texas, and now both schools are starting to emerge into their own here in the last decade. It's third down, 3-12 to go, first half. Murray throws one quickly, Thompson intercepted. Coming over is Jimmy Warren, 45 to pick it off. This is one of the, this is one of the few times that Tom Powell, a free safety, number nine, right there. Watch him blitz on this. 
And of course, Jimmy Warren does a great job. Murray reacts beautifully. He's got one on one coverage. From up here, it looked like he had the lead, but the ball was slightly underthrown. A great job by Jimmy Warren reacting to the ball while it was in the air. Well, the blocking pattern, not expecting Powell to come, they leave the alley open. And Murray, seeing number nine, pressuring him, threw quickly. And there, as you pointed out, it was underthrown and intercepted by Warren. And now Pat Dye and Auburn, they will have a chance with 3.06 to go in leading at the half or perhaps even add to it. It's 13-12, Auburn over Texas A&M. Bo Jackson getting to the 19-yard line. Wayne Asbury, 16 from that Aggie secondary, bringing the Heisman Trophy winner down. Brent with uh, 250 left to go. I think I would try to get that ball back and those hands on a pass, a screen, or some kind of play like they had, because once he gets out in the open, the offensive line of Auburn is not establishing and controlling the Texas A&M defense. Texas is doing a good job. Washington to throw. Incomplete. James Flowers, 15, was covering the Freddie Wigan. Well, we're 225 away from half, and we're coming up. We'll visit with Lindsey Nelson, and he'll take you through the history of this great bowl game. And we'll meet the Chevrolet coach and players of the year. And, of course, we'll have some of the halftime pageantry here from Dallas. Could not ask for a better day, weather oh, conditions. Beautiful. For a football game. Beautiful. setback it's Bo he slips out as a receiver but Washington looking the other way throws incomplete over through Wagan and out of bounds I tell you Aaron I gotta have Bo Jackson throw the ball I think you're right absolutely right either that or have Washington throw him the ball Colbert to punt well he got no. off one of his weak punts last time with only 30 yards it's been sort of Aggressively coming back after that 61 yarder to open this cotton ball. He'll hit this one near the 10. Oh, there's the better one. Hawkins, 34. Okay. And they force him into the middle, not letting him get outside containment that time. A 46 yard punt and only a six yard return. Plenty of time, coach, for AM. Yeah. Two minutes and eight seconds. That's go. plenty of time for Murray. coming on into the huddle. His tight end has been his favorite target so far, number 29, Rod Bernstein, but he also has capable receivers and Jeff Nelson, who led the Southwest Conference in receptions. He's been deadly on this down. Should have been handled. Incomplete. Looked like he might have thrown that one a little too hard. He had, didn't have much distance between himself and the receiver. It looked like he really unloaded it. That was Woodside, coach, who scored a touchdown on that one running play who came out of the wing spot. Second and ten. Ball is at the Aggie 34-yard line. One setback is Beck. This is complete again to Bernstein, the tight end. Short of a first down. There'll be a third down play coming up. Warming up is the other kicker. That is Scott Slater of Texas A&M. It is possible that if they get close, Jackie Sherrill will attempt to use Slater. Murray's pass complete for the first down. Woodside, and he gets inside the 20-yard line, down to the 12. Tom Powell finally brought him down. They did not converge well in that secondary. Well, I, it looked like he was trapped on the inside, and the linebackers were going to get him, but he escaped from them. And of course, the secondary people had to recover there on the two deep. Let's take another look at it here. Murray slides outside the pocket to the left, and he drills it right in. You can see number 47, Carriker, thought he was going to knock it off. And 93, Andre Bruce misses him. And then, of course, the secondary people, you see Warren coming over, and number three, Porter. Finally, nine, the free safety, Tom Powell gets him down. Woodside, the sophomore from Louisiana, having a big game. He's in at the tail, on the pitch to him. 
He comes, and he is met there on the short side and run out of bounds at the 10-yard line. A minute and four seconds remaining in the first half. And him trailing Auburn by a point in this Cotton Bowl, 13-12. The Aggies can get a first down inside the three-yard line. But with a minute to go, of course, they're thinking touchdown right now. A field goal, however, would put them ahead. Johnson checks in. The throw is come out of bounds. Incomplete. Shea Walker. And he is arguing that he was pushed out of bounds as he made the catch. Warren did a nice job again. Jimmy Warren, number 45, on the sideline. Got enough contact on him to get him out of bounds. Warren, Murray drilling the pass to Walker, Walker going up, and Warren getting right at him to make sure, at least make it tough on the official, make him make the call, right? <laughs> ah, he was out of bounds, the third and eight. Kevin Murray, not liking what he was seeing down there, and he will call timeout. And he'll come on over here and confer with the coaching staff. Meanwhile, let's us take a listen and see this message from the NCAA. Harold, let's take one more look at that pass. You can see the ball's deflected right there by number 41, Thomas, but he still is, the ball is caught by Walker right there. He was knocked out of bounds. He wasn't even close to being in bounds. Well, I don't know if they have a short pattern for Bernstein. But he has certainly been a dangerous receiver for Murray. This is third down. The ball is at the 10-yard line. Bernstein trying to get free. They throw back to Nelson, who can't get it. It was crossing underneath the tight end that time. It'll be fourth down, and a &M will attempt a field goal with Scott Slater. He'll be the second kicker that they will have used this half. Watch Nelson in motion here, and he cuts clear across. He's wide open. The defenders run into one another, which he wanted to have happen, but the ball is thrown slightly behind him by Kevin Murray. Otherwise, it would have been a score. A 26-yard attempt by Slater. Kick is on its way, and Slater puts A&M ahead. Sophomore from Fort Worth, Texas, gets an opportunity, and another barefooted kicker has given Texas A&M the lead with 50 seconds to go here in the first half. It is 15-13. The Aggies, and now again we'll get to see the 12th man, those 10 non-scholarship students waving the towels and getting ready to come downfield for the Aggies. The yell leader getting the student body whipped up. No one has ever returned a kickoff more than 29 yards against this group. And Slater will kick it off. it is very difficult for them to strike 80 yards because they are not equipped with the kind of a passing game to work against the clock right now. Well, basically, the drives they put on against Alabama, and for most of the year, as evidenced by the fact they only have two touchdown passes, the one that Bo just ran was their third uh, by uh, Washington, and they generally grind it out, possession football, and I really think that's what they're going to have to do in the second half, maintain possession to keep it away if they possibly can. Jeff Berger, number 12, stepping into your picture, is the new quarterback. He's the sophomore from Cedartown, Georgia. Hey, hey, hey. Handing off to the fullback, 
and Reggie Ware straight ahead with time running down here. They get it down to 40 seconds. Washington leaves having completed two of seven passes for Pat Dye. Dye wanting the messenger service to hurry up a little bit and get the play in from the sideline. Lawyer Tillman, a fleet freshman, checks in and you would have to think that they are setting the stage here to go long in his direction if they can. Berger is back. Waits. Throws down the left. And it is complete at the 45-yard line. Eight seconds left on the clock. Wagan, the intended receiver, a 31-yard gain. Do they have enough time to run a play and get the field goal unit on the field? Well, it's going to be really close with that eight seconds. He'd have to run an out pattern um, probably at the 35-yard line, which would be about 11-yard gain to kill the clock. That pass was thrown very well. Wagan got in between the zone defenders. And let's take a look at Freddie Wagan, who reminds some of Terry Beasley, simply because he has the same colored hair, all right? Flaming red, number 14 going up, concentrating, and making a good catch against the Aggies. Kip Corrington that time, the safety man number 10, sort of got off balance with a step that he took. He was in good position, but got out of balance. No oh, reminder, of course, we've got the Cowboys and the Rams Saturday afternoon. We'll start our coverage with the NFL today at 3.30 Eastern Time, live from Anaheim Stadium. Then on Sunday, we'll take the entourage into Soldier Field, Giants and the Bears. The NFL today will be live from Chicago, 12 noon Eastern Time. Berger, the quarterback. Middleton, the motion man. They pitch to Jackson. He steps outside near the 40-yard line with three seconds showing on that clock. Well, they're going to give it a try, I think. No, I guess not. Colbert, can, no, I guess they're going to give it a try. Chris Johnson will attempt a field goal with three seconds to go. Colbert is in because he is the holder for Johnson. Right. So he will put the ball down, and this will be a 57-yard attempt by Johnson. Sure. The Aggies will take a lead over Pat Dye and Auburn into the locker room here at the intermission of the 50th annual Cotton Bowl Classic. Texas A&M leading Auburn 15 to 13. We'll be back with the memories of Cotton Bowl past and the rest of our halftime activities. Halftime at the 50th Cotton Bowl and Texas A&M is two up on Auburn. 15 to 13. Let's take a moment and listen to the Auburn Tiger marching band. Well, they sponsored our most valuable player of the game award. Recently, Brent Musburger was on hand when Chevrolet presented their top honors for the season of 1985. Since the college football season began on CBS Sports in September, our commentators have selected Chevrolet most valuable players in each game. Chevrolet then donates $1,000 to the General Scholarship Fund of both participating schools for use by qualified students in their chosen academic fields. And annually, Chevrolet selects the offensive and defensive players of the year and the coaches of the year along with CBS Sports. And we're pleased today to be with Mr. Tom Stout, Chevrolet's General Marketing Manager, who will make the presentations to the award winners. Tom? Brent, thank you. It's always a special thrill to honor year-long excellence, both on the playing field and in the coaching ranks. And it's certainly rewarding to honor the coaches whose responsibility it is to develop leadership and excellence in our athletes. Well, Tom, the Division 1A Coach of the Year is Fisher DeBerry of the Air Force Academy. The 47-year-old head coach is only in his second year at Air Force. He led the Falcons to an 11-1 record, their best since 1958, when the team was 9-0-2, as well as a share of the Western Athletic Conference crown, the Academy's first ever. 
Now, his high-flying Falcons set school records for touchdowns and points scored, and they were one of three Division I-A schools to score at least 21 points in each game that they played this season. Congratulations, Coach DeBerry. You're coming out of a pressure-packed season. The training, guidance, and inspiration you gave your players resulted in their going all out to make this a very memorable year. Well, thank you very much, and I accept this award with sincere appreciation. I just want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank CBS and Chevrolet for their tremendous support to college football, and I accept this honor on behalf of our young men at the academy and our, my fellow assistant coaches uh, for the tremendous job they did during this year. They're the ones that really are deserving of this award, and I just appreciate them giving me the opportunity of pumping up the balls on Thursday afternoon before the game. But it is indeed an honor for everybody here at the United States Air Force Academy. Now it's time for the presentation of the Chevrolet Most Valuable Offensive and Defensive Players of the Year. Yes, Brent, and when you think of all the great performances we've seen all year long, to pick the one offensive and defensive player that stands out among all the others certainly had to be a great challenge. It really was, and our Most Valuable Defensive Player of the Year is defensive tackle Mike Hammerstein of the University of Michigan. Bo Schembechler calls his 6'4", 250-pound senior from Wapakoneta, Ohio, the best individual pass rusher ever to play for the Wolverines. For the season, Mike had 73 tackles, including 22 tackles for losses while sacking the quarterback nine times. Hammerstein was a consensus All-America, a Lombardi finalist, and one big reason why the Michigan Wolverines gave up only five touchdowns this last year. Mike, you're certainly most deserving of this award. And I should add that this trophy will be inscribed with your name on it and will go on display permanently at the College Football Hall of Fame in Kings Island, Ohio. Thanks. I'd just like to, on behalf of the Michigan team, the defense, thank CBS and Chevrolet for this award. I think it's uh, mainly a reflection of how well our team and especially defense played this year. We, uh, we came to play, we played hard, and we played good. And I'd just also like to thank CBS and Chevrolet for their continuing support in college football. Tom, certainly no surprise about our Offensive Player of the Year. He is running back Bo Jackson from Auburn, and Bo will add this prestigious award to his growing list of honors, which include the 1985 Heisman Trophy and the Walter Camp Outstanding Player of the Year. A consensus All-America, Bo rushed for 1,786 yards and scored 17 touchdowns in 1985. Wow, Bo, you've had an exceptional season and a spectacular career at Auburn. In your leadership, teamwork and outstanding individual performances have inspired teammates and fans alike. Congratulations on a great year, Bo. Thank you very, very much. And I don't think that I could have done this without the help of my teammates. And I would like to give thanks to Chevrolet and CBS for nominating me for this award because there's a whole lot of good people out there that work just as hard as I have. And I'm just fortunate enough to come out on top. Well, let me add my congratulations to all the award winners, and Tom, thank you very much for your continuous support of college athletics, plus financial aid to the students through the Chevrolet Scholarship Program. Long ago on the frontier, homeowner's insurance meant knowing the cavalry was close at hand. That kind of protection was hard to beat. It still is. Today, Kemper provides insurance to homeowners, condo owners, and renters with a wide range of money-saving discounts. And you can count on professional service from the independent agents who represent the Kemper Cavalry. To protect your homestead, compare Kemper. You ride with us. Nothing works like a Chevy truck. Ford Tech Muscle. For Auburn 15-13. And on the field right now, the Fighting Texas Aggie Band. Let's go down and have a listen.
the golden anniversary of the Cotton Bowl. 50 years and so many great moments. And a man who has been associated with the Cotton Bowl through so many years. In fact, over at CBS Radio right now, Lindsey Nelson is working on his 26th Cotton Bowl broadcast. So when it was time for us to take a look back at all the golden memories, there was only man who could do it justice. Just one, Lindsey Nelson. If stadiums could only talk, what memories they could recite of days gone by, yesterday's heroes, moments won and lost in the sun. This marvelous stadium was first built in 1930, and over the past 50 years has housed one of college football's classic New Year's Day events, the Cotton Bowl. But it was not always the showcase that it is today. The Cotton Bowl Classic was started in 1937 by a Dallas entrepreneur, J. Curtis Sanford. The first Cotton Bowl featured Marquette University versus TCU. Tickets were $2.20, and Curtis Sanford promised each team $10,000. Mike Murray's Marquette squad was one of the nation's best. They were led by All-American Buzz Bubis, while TCU counted with slinging Sammy Ball. The game was expected to be a high-scoring affair, but neither Ball nor Bubis were the biggest stars. That honor belonged to Little Dutch Meyer, a third team in and the nephew of TCU head coach Dutch Meyer. The year was 1946. Texas would meet Missouri, and one young Texan would stand tall that day. He could run and kick, throw and catch like none before him. And that afternoon, he would do it all, having a hand in all 40 Texas points. He wore number 33 that day, but forever will be remembered as old number 22, Bobby Lane. As long as people talk about bowl games, forever they will remember the improbable meeting of Tommy Lewis of Alabama and Dickie Magel of Rice. Dickie Magel takes off to the right. Walker's turn the flankers, and that's clear Dickie for the outside. Now for the unexpected. From out of nowhere comes Tommy Lewis, and Magel is tipped down. I thought the, the right side of the stadium fell in on me. It was a spontaneous thing. He just saw me running for a touchdown and say, hey, I'm going to get this guy. In the years to come, the memory of the 54 Cotton Bowl would be more bittersweet for one than the other. But like Roy Regals, the names Tommy Lewis and Dickie Magel have a special place in the minds and hearts of college football fans everywhere. The 64 Cotton Bowl would pit the nation's top two teams, Darrell Royal's 10-0 Longhorns and Wayne Harden's 9-1 Midshipmen. In the first five minutes, Texas scored on two TD passes from Duke Carlisle to Phil Harris. After that, the great Texas defense teed off on Heisman Trophy winner Roger Staubach. There was very little doubt who was number one. Darrell Royal had his 28-6 victory and the national championship. The 70s would open with Notre Dame versus Texas. With time running out in the fourth period and Texas losing 17-14, Texas found itself with fourth down and two, decision time for Coach Darrell Royal and his quarterback. The game would be decided by this James Street pass to Cotton Spire. And all of a sudden, I heard the roar come out of the far stands, and I knew then that Spire had made, obviously, an unbelievable catch, scooping the ball right off the ground in a pass reception that gave Texas four more opportunities to score. It wouldn't take four downs as Billy Dale raced in for the score, clinching the national championship for Darrell Royal's Texas Longhorn. In 1971, these two teams would meet again, but this time it would be Notre Dame's turn in the victory circle. Led by quarterback Joe Theismann, Notre Dame would produce 21 points in the first 16 and a half minutes. And Notre Dame would end one of the greatest streaks in college football, Texas's 30-game winning streak with a 24-11 victory. The 70 and 71 games added greatly to the rich history of the Cotton Bowl, for it brought together two schools with outstanding programs and two magnificent coaches and gentlemen. We didn't have even a hint of controversy or disagreement of any kind. And that's the way I like to, to, to coach. That's the way I like to play college football. And uh, I'm glad that Aaron and I had our two contests, and I think it came out about right, 50-50. 1979 featured Houston and Notre Dame in a very memorable game. An ice storm hit Dallas that year, and there is only one word to describe the weather, cold. Houston led 34 to 12 midway through the fourth quarter. But Joe Montana's passing and scrambling brought the Irish back. And with this two-point conversion to Chris Haynes, the Irish trailed 34 to 28, but Montana wasn't through. 
With two seconds on the clock, Montana rolled right and unbelievably found Haynes again in the corner of the end zone. The miracle man had knotted the score at 34. And Joe Eunice's kick would secure one of the greatest comebacks ever. And so ended the decade of the 70s. In the 80s at the Cotton Bowl, the parade of stars continued. Pittsburgh Panthers brought in a quarterback named Dan Marino. They played the Mustangs of Southern Methodist University, who featured a running back named Eric Dickerson. And how he could run. And who could forget Georgia's John Lastinger and his dash from 17 yards out into the end zone to defeat 11-0 Texas and deny the national championship to Fred Akers Longhorn. And they gave Vince Dooley a ride off the field. And the little man who won the Heisman Trophy, Doug Flutie, with his magnificent talent, passing and running. If stadiums could only talk, what memories they could recite of days gone by, moments won and lost in the sun. The Cotton Bowl Classic is more than a game, and its rich tradition is more than the victories and defeats. What sets it apart are the people, leaders like Bob Cullum, Felix McKnight, and Phil Scoville, players like Tommy Lewis and Dickie Magel, Lane, Walker, Campbell, and Flutie, coaches named Bryant and Bell, Neely and Neyland, Royal and Parsegian. They are the heart and soul. They and thousands of others have embraced this game for one simple reason, their genuine love of college football. And so do you, Curtis Sanford. We salute you for having the vision and courage to bring a football game to the city of Dallas. From Sammy Vaughn to Bo Jackson, it's been a great 50 years. Admiral Cotton Bowl Classic, Texas A&M, leading by two points over Auburn. It is 15-13. Hey, the Aggies have had a couple of impressive runners in that backfield. Not only that, they've had a couple of good passes from Murray. These two fellows contributed, of course, Roger Vick and Keith Woodside. But Murray has also passed for 185 yards, and they have almost 300 yards in the first half of this football game. All right, here's the Woodside run for the score. How about this lead block you wanted to... Watch Tony, number 25, block Phillips. And Woodside cuts right off of that, right there. That's why that play went for a touchdown. It was 22 yards. Woodside zipping into the end zone for the Aggies. One of their two touchdowns that they scored. And, of course, how about the big fella? Number 34, Bo Jackson. Well, you're the one that said yesterday if you were coaching, you'd get the ball in his hands on a pass. And that's exactly what happened here on a screen. Now, you watch Wilson, number 75. The left guard also on the lead. He'll get a great block out in front of this. And, of course, when Bo Jackson gets the ball in his hands and in the open field, and that's what you need to do, that's what they need to do, no one's going to catch him because of his tremendous speed. All right, and two big developments, of course, in the first half era. The fact that Auburn changed quarterbacks, Texas A&M, well, they changed their field goal specialists. So looking ahead to the second half, what do you foresee? Well, I think we're going to see Jeff Berger, the number two quarterback. He's a 53% passer. But I, if I was Pat Dye, I would go back to what has brought him here, which is the running game, because... The more first downs that he can grind out with Bo Jackson and Ware and the rest of them, the less time that Murray and company have to move the football. They are an explosive offensive football team, and that's what I would do if I was Pat Dye. All right, Aaron, you know, in the first half, Jim Nance mentioned in one of his reports that there have been allegations by one Dallas newspaper and a television station about recruiting violations at Texas A&M. I spoke to Jackie Sherrill about that. Does Texas A&M pay its football players to come here and play for Jackie Show? No, they don't. And it, it's it's one thing, and it's like we all in this profession. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, I try to explain it, a guy driving down the road, driving 55 miles an hour, uh, but I don't even know who the guy is. I don't know what kind of car he's in, but I'm responsible because he's driving 55. Uh, our profession, uh, which being an athletic director and head coach, uh, there's 300,000, 500,000 people out there. And when somebody says, yes, you know what everybody does 24 hours a day, that's not true. Uh, but yet you're responsible for it, and we take responsibility and full responsibility. Now, there is credibility here. There is credibility academically uh, with our students. There is credibility in things that we're doing with our program. Uh, am I going to sit here and tell you that 
anything outside uh, it has not been done, I can't say that. Uh, but I will tell you this, that if there is, then we'll correct it. We'll take measures to prevent it, and we'll go, go on about a business. Hamburger place. The 50th Cotton Bowl Classic is sponsored by Today's Chevrolet, who invites you to live the style, performance, and fun of Chevrolet in 86. The investment firm of Smith Barney. They make money the old-fashioned way. They earn it. And by Budweiser. Beechwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Start the second half. Texas A&M with its famed 12th man kickoff team set to go downfield. Those non-scholarship students, walk-ons who tried out, if you will. It started back in 1983. There were 200 candidates, all of whom played high school football, but all of whom were a step too slow or perhaps an inch or two too short. But they have found a spot in the hearts of Aggie fans everywhere, and here they come. Pickoff fielded out the 10, and for the left side, the return by Alvin out to the 35. Now, for a look at that Auburn offense, let's go down on the field, and here's Jim Nance. But Brent, Pat Washington will not start the second half at quarterback for Auburn. He has a bruised thigh, and if it doesn't loosen up, he will not return. Jeff Berger, the sophomore, will quarterback Auburn in this series. Let's go back upstairs. And here is Jeff Berger on the field. This is a first down starting the second half. The Tigers trail Texas A&M by two points. Berger has set behind him A.G. and, of course, Bo Jackson. The toss to Bo. Cole closes quickly on the right side at the 40. Larry Kelm, 65, their leading tackler, jumps in there. And there are some of the halftime numbers. Well, you can see the total yardage when you combine the two. is 298 yards for Texas A&M and just 150 for Auburn, and that is the big figure right there. Of course, the score is still very close, 15-13. Era in that first half, the All-American linebacker, Johnny Holland, up against the Auburn offense, had only two tackles and assisted on four others. They run right straight up the middle, and getting away from Kell momentarily was Tommy Agee. Good little fake there inside to draw the linebackers to the right, and of course then Berger slipped the ball and on the fullback's hands, A.G., and he made good yardage on the play. This is what they need to do. Take a look at this action in heavy. Boy, I'll tell you, if you're an umpire in college or professional football, that traffic can get you. And it's amazing, Eric, to me that more umpires don't get knocked about five yards like that one did. Well, Jeff Parks got two blocks that time. <laughs> That's right. A first down for Auburn to start the second half. In case you were not with us at the start of the game, Texas A&M fumbled and Pat Dye and Auburn took it in and had an early lead. A&M then scoring twice and Bo Jackson electrified this crowd of 73,000 with a 73-yard touchdown run after taking a pass from Pat Washington. The backup quarterback, Scott Berger, at the controls for Auburn. He throws short, Domingo Bryan intercepts. Way underthrown. Bryant is across midfield and down at the 48. And another big play by number six of Texas A&M. They had the receiver open here. Berger throws the ball, but it's underthrown, as you pointed out, Brent. You'll see the receiver open. Domingo Bryant does a beautiful job of reacting to the ball while it's in the air. The secondary has played exceptionally well. First and ten for Kevin Murray. Woodside and Tony are the running backs. And also, Tony gets the first down call. Gerald Robinson and Tracy Rocker rock him down on first down. And there is Domingo Bryant who made more big plays than any defender in the Southwest Conference this season. That seven sacks does a lot of blitzing. Good player. Second and nine. Murray brings Nelson in motion, and he's got him inside the 35-yard line. Powell bringing him down. First and ten for the Aggies. This 
Well, Kevin Murray has got yeah. some live arm. I was thinking the same thing. Boy, he really drills this one in there. Look at it from the side. That ball's not in the air very long, and it's right on target, folks. There he is. He gets good protection here. There's the zip. He really lets it go. And that ball is right there to the receiver. Tony turns upfield. Getting to the 27-yard line. Carricker, 47, smacking him down there. Coach Jackie Sherrill in his fourth year after taking that highly publicized quarter of a million dollar annual contract to come down to Texas A&M. Did the job this year. When they had to, they beat SMU, Arkansas, and Texas to win the Southwest title. Tony again in the middle, squeezing close to the 20-yard line. Pat Thomas, 41, bringing him down there. For years, they have told Aggie jokes down here in the state of Texas. Yesterday at the banquet, Coach Jackie Sherrill stood up and told the audience, the Aggie joke that I've been hearing recently is, what do you call an Aggie four years after he's out of Texas A&M? The boss. <laughs> they like that one. First down. Woodside a motion. Pitch. Tony cuts inside. He's free. At the five. He'll score. The Aggies have another touchdown to the Cotton Bowl. football. It has been difficult for this team. AM electing to go for two points, leading 21-13. Murray will throw. Diving catch is not good. Nelson going after the ball, and it'll stay at 21-13. AM leading Auburn. So two turnovers have helped set up two of the three Aggie scores. Watch 95, Gerald Robertson, the left end, right there, fires to the inside, overruns it, and of course Tony cuts it back. Then he makes, he finds the daylight. Right there you see number 46, who is Edward Phillips. Number nine, Tom Powell misses. There's another miss. Great running by Tony, and they're in the end zone for another touchdown, and Texas A&M is a little ahead of schedule. They average 31 points a game. Trying to boost it to 23. Just underthrown and through the hands of a diving Jeff Nelson. So we'll come back. Tony has scored. It's 21-13. We went for a two-point conversion, leading by eight. I agree with you. Put the ninth point on the board. It requires two scores. Now they could be tied with a touchdown on a two-point play. So here come the 12 men, all of them non-scholarship, including the kicker Slater, who is also a walk-on. And now we'll see them strut their stuff. I can hear some pads cracking and popping, and Fullwood was trying so hard to break one. But Dean Barry, number one, 12 men, was able to get down. But I must say that Auburn doing better than the average team on the returns. Let's take a look at the 12th man. Teams have been managed to crack an opening on the seam right here as you'll see it. But the reaction from the secondary people coming in closes down the hole very quickly and they've been able to do a good job. I think I would have stayed in English class. First and 10, the ball is at the 29-yard line. Here's the pitch to Bo Jackson, but he's jammed up. No hole there. Jay Muller cut him off. sidelines. The plays are called upstairs by assistant coach Crow. Pat with final approval. And Michigan has jumped back. Weren't they behind 14-3? And now Bo Schimbeckler is in complete command of that Fiesta Bowl game. Oh, good job there. This is a second and nine. Berger faking to Jackson. And the play has been whistled dead. A penalty flag thrown on the far side against the Tigers. And that is 
the first penalty against Pat Dye here this afternoon in this Cotton Bowl. Legal procedure on a white, still first down. Errol, when the score was 15-13, you said to me, I think Pat Dye should try to run the ball and stay with what got him here. Now that it has grown to 21-13, do you still agree with that? Well, I, I think that they've got to do everything they possibly can to keep the ball away from the Texas A&M offense. They are just so explosive. Run the clock down. They are only one touchdown on the two-point play away from tying the ball game. But here's Berger to throw. Goes to Wagan, who was out of bounds on the far sideline. No completion. It'll be a third down. James Flowers, 15, was the Aggie defensive back working on that side. Trying to run an out pattern for a first down. Both the receivers going down, breaking to the outside. Flowers comes right up. Good coverage. Ball's out of bounds. There's no way it could have been Wagan. Could have caught that ball for any kind of yardage. If he can get outside and get the first down and then some across midfield. That marvelous speed. Great call. Sprint draw. Texas was deployed to put a blitz on. Domingo Black was coming from that corner spot and he ran right inside. Number 30 AG does a good job in his lead block. Watch here as the hole really opens as they're rushing the passer, thinking it's going to be a pass. There goes AG 30 leading the play. And Wagant throws a block downfield, and Jackson's finally run out of bounds after getting the first down and additional yardage, 32 to be exact. Fullwood is in, and Reggie Ware, the fullback and the short man, crashes to the 40-yard line. Old Bryant and Sadler making the stop there for the Aggies. Scott Bolton checks in. Fullback Ware bending down into the huddle to hear what play has been called by the Auburn staff. Fullwood now is the tailback. Two tight ends, one wide receiver. Here's Fullwood. And he bounces free and gets to the 30-yard line for a first down. Bryant finally wrestling into the turf there. But that was a fine-looking run by Fullwood, who will now leave as Bo Jackson reappears for Auburn. You know, with the, the Tigers on the move here, we want to extend a greeting to our viewers in Central Alabama who are watching on WAKA Channel 8. Today marks the station's first day of broadcasting CBS programming exclusively in the Selma, Montgomery area. And your favorite football team just ran AG right straight ahead. He busts past the 25-yard line on that first down. said that's their favorite team let me just add to that sentence you are watching your favorite team on this new year's day i don't want all those letters from the roll tide folks down there <laughs> that other favorite team down there's already played its bowl game boy that mike shill is a good quarterback isn't he burger handing off bo jackson trying to come around the corner out of bounds before he could get to the 20. Wayne Asbury and Johnny Holland over there cutting him off. Now they're in that four down area and that's exactly what I would do is stay on the ground and keep pounding it. That's the way they've had success this year. Jackson's now 14 for 72 yards and one touchdown. Of course that was that 73 yarder so he's up to 140 some yards in total offense. A touchdown and a two-point conversion, and we'd have a deadlock in the Cotton Bowl. 8.54 to go in the third. Short man Ware spinning, and he is down to the 17-yard line, and it was Johnny Holland, the All-American linebacker, tackling him there. Tommy Agee replacing Ware, and Holland looking over at the sideline for the defensive call. Watch on this third down play. Here's Jackson carrying out his fake completely on a third down and short yardage. Like they're going to pitch the ball out to him. Pulling. He's an unselfish, unselfish football player that all the team members love. There's a fake to Jackson again. He'll throw incomplete. Now, 
Todd Howard did not buy the fake. He went right for the quarterback, and that disrupted the play. Bryant had coverage on the outside, but number 73 is the one who disrupted that attack by Auburn. Well, they've had great difficulty in trying to establish any kind of a passing game. Now they're faced with a second down situation in 10. They'll use their two tight ends. Agee's the fullback. Wagan is split out far to the left. Jackson in the middle, close to the 10-yard line. It'll be a third down. Auburn must get to the seven for a first down in this drive. It was again a fine fullback lead. They had a great hole blocked at the point of attack. And Jackson found it, but now they're faced with third down. Just three or four. If they'd run that on the first play, Brent, they would have had second down and short. Auburn quarterbacks are only three of 11 throwing today. And that's why they'll run Jackson, and he's going to be short. Alex Morris was the first Aggie to hit him, and Kelm was not too far behind. They're trying to muffle it right off this right side. You can see 82 there blocking down to the inside, which is Jeff Parks. But there just wasn't enough of a scene for him to get the first down. Now the coach is having some difficulty with the play being called. And they must hurry, of course, with the 30-second clock in progress. But we're going to have a timeout call, too. So there was some confusion on the far sideline, and we'll be right back. John Houseman for Smith Barney. When it comes to personal service, today's Gulliver-sized firms are often tied in knots. They make their customers feel like Lilliputians. Smith Barney is managed on a human scale. Big enough to offer an array of investment services, not too big to treat clients as individuals. Smith Barney, they make money the old-fashioned way. They earn it. My wife was having our second child, and uh, so Anthony and I were on our own. And we went to the store, and I picked up a bargain baby shampoo, not Johnson's. I thought I was just helping out, but we used it, and Anthony got some shampoo in his eyes, and he began to cry. And uh, I felt awful. They may say baby shampoo, but many bargain brands sting, irritate eyes. Only Johnson says, no more tears. No more tears isn't just an ad slogan. It's very real. We're sticking with Johnson. Just when it seemed we couldn't go any higher or make our batteries last any longer, we at Duracell topped ourselves. Introducing the new highly improved copper top battery. So improved it'll last up to 30% longer than any battery we've ever made. Once again, Duracell reaches a new height. Duracell, when it comes to making them last longer, we never stop. Well, Pat Dye used that timeout to decide he would kick a field goal in this situation. It is fourth and two. Chris Johnson with a 26-yard attempt. And Johnson boots one through for the Auburn Tigers. And they inch a little closer to Texas A&M. 7-19 to go in the third quarter. And A&M leads by five points. 21-16. to The NFL today, live from Anaheim. We'll be on the air at 3.30 Eastern time. We'll meet John Robinson, the Los Angeles Rams, and we'll check in live. See who's going to play quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Down here in Dallas, everyone expects it to be Danny White. And everyone expects it to be a very close football game out there Saturday afternoon, too. So it'll be the Cowboys and the Rams in our coverage. Starts at 3.30 Eastern time here on CBS. And then on Sunday, well, the cast moves to Soldier Field in Chicago. Dan Deardorff will join us there. And we'll take a look at a city that has gone wild over its NFL team. One that's gone wild over the Giants is New York. 
I got to the airport when I left to come down here, and the fellow checking my bag at the airlines, he said to me, the New Jersey Jets are out, but the New York Giants are still playing. <laughs> you must own an airline, you know? You walk a few miles. Here's the kickoff by Johnson. And Rod Harris of the Aggies with the return gets out to the 22-yard line. 7.14 to go here in the third. It is 21-16. Well, here comes that Aggie offense that has impressed you so much today, Coach. Well, they really have been tremendous. They, I tell you, I'm really impressed with them. It's one of the best offenses I have seen. They're so well balanced. Keep a lot of pressure on you. And they're so young. And next year, they've got a 368-pound tackle. who was redshirted this year because of an injury. Marshall Land will join them. They run with Vic, who has replaced Tony in this series, and he gets out past the 25-yard line. They're so tough what they can alternate fullbacks who are of almost equal ability. As we talked at the top of the show, the ability of both Vic and Tony and the yardage that they've made, they had 20 touchdowns between the two of them, of course. As we pointed out, the Jackson had 17, so you can see the reason why because of this offense. Vic with 58 yards, Tony with 53. They're the fullback twins of the Aggies, and here comes Vic looking for daylight. Got just beyond the 30-yard line, Brian Smith, number 90, meeting him there for Auburn. It will be short of a first down. So they'll set up a power formation here. It's about third and perhaps a yard and a half. Ira Valentine has come into the full house set along with Harry Johnson. Well, it's going to be close. It sure is. The middle of that Auburn defense was ready. Kevin Murray, 14, checking over there to see if Vic got that football past the line. They'll use an official's timeout to measure for it. I don't think he got it from this vantage point. It's going to be awful close. Well, Tracy Rocker and Arthur Johnson of Pat Dye's defensive unit plugged that hole. Short. He is that short. And Texas A&M will punt at the six-minute mark of the third. Could wind up being a key third down in this cotton ball. We'll have to see. Tiger holding the War Eagle aloft over there. Gingerly. Chance. Comes back to punt and Drake Anis, the return man. Low punt. Anis lets it bounce. And it takes an Aggie bounce. I'm not so sure he shouldn't have fielded it on one hop. Ball getting down to the five-yard line. It'll be tough field position for Bo Jackson when we come back. A 65-yard punt. Hilton brings you competition. Jim Nance. Jim? Brent, one of the top sports stories, I believe, in 1985 was this young man winning a PGA event. Amateur Scott Verpike. Scott, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm in school finishing up at Oklahoma State. How about golf coming up in the future? What do you have? Oh, I have a lot of tournaments coming up. I'm going to play the tournament champions in about two weeks and play a few tour events as well, some college tournaments. All right. We will see you at the Masters as well. I'll be there. Of course, we'll have that on CBS. The PGA Tour opens up and... January 25th, the Phoenix Open here on CBS. Let's go back upstairs. Young man with a great future. There's the pitch to Bo Jackson. From the six-yard line, he comes out near the 12-yard line. Johnny Holland riding him down. Jeff Berger, the young quarterback who is under the gun right now for Pat Dye, stands six feet, weighs 200 pounds. He started a couple of games for Dye at quarterback against Southern Mississippi and Tennessee, and he played for Auburn in five games. He rushed for 46 yards on 12 carries. His longest pass play was 42 yards to Freddie Wagan. And he will run Reggie Ware straight ahead into the heart of that Aggie defense. That's going to leave them with a third 
and four. I'm running down here in the third quarter. 21-16, Texas A&M leading Auburn. You might look at that sprint draw again that they had success with on Jackson in the passing situation. There's Jackson cutting upfield into the hole and the first down for Auburn. Big first down. Gets them out of a punting situation. Keeps the drive alive. Let's take a look at Johnny Holland, number 11, the All-American linebacker right there. Keeping on his feet, moving with the pitch sweep. Warding off the blocker, 87 Middleton, and then coming back inside and holding on to Bo Jackson. Nice job by Holland. Jackson has now rushed for 90 yards. A.G. returns as the Auburn fullback. Middleton is in motion. The fake to A.G., the pitch to Jackson. And the defense would not let Jackson turn inside that time. And Domingo Bryant rode him down. And the Aggies held their position defensively. Watch Jackson, who is such a great talent, run under control. He lets his blocking develop. Then he will see whether or not there's daylight there. Carrington has cut off the inside. Bryant comes off of Middleton and makes a splendid tackle right there. Second and nine. And of course, yesterday, one of the plays we watched Auburn practice was the halfback option pass from this situation. They'll run Jackson straight ahead into the hole, and he has another first down. Corrington, 10, brings him down. Kip Corrington, academic All-American down here with a grade point average of 3.94 in philosophy. You see the sprint draw again on the passing situation. Good blocking. Randy Stokes comes around, number 64, and pulls the lead it. Good yardage on the play, a first down. And that put Jackson over the 100-yard mark rushing. And that is his 22nd 100-yard game. Brent Fullwood. You know, he's only played 39 games. How about that naked bootleg by Berger? He'll keep it. Now he'll chuck it downfield to Parks. And Parks gets across midfield, had he crossed the scrimmage line. Jackie Sherrill is complaining that he did, but there is no flag down there. It's a 23-yard game. Now a couple of the officials are conferring. Now the referee brings in a third one down there for a huddle. The line of scrimmage is and just in count. front of the marker right here. Let's see how close he gets to it. Oh, he's past it. His right foot is past the line. They missed it. But he was close. He was close, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> that only counts in horseshoes, as they say, huh? First down for Auburn. That was a... The official missed that call. That should have been, been, brought, been brought back. And it could be a big factor in this football game. Yeah. Sure, if they can keep this drive going. Definitely. There's Fullwood. Got away from one tackle, but not Johnny Holland. Let's take a look at that with Arrow. Do you suppose you can draw the line of scrimmage for us? Here's the line of scrimmage. And his foot will hit about here. You see the ball is just beyond that. Let's take a look again. Makes the fake, bootlegs the ball. Now watch that line and watch his right foot and where the ball was. His right foot is way past it. Not as close as I thought. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no wonder Cheryl was so upset down there. He had a right to be. Second and nine. Berger under pressure just as he's being walloped by Sadler. Held the ball perhaps a fraction of a count too long that time. Rod Sadler someday will be strutting in the National Football League. He's out of Columbia, Georgia, and he still has another year to go at Texas A&M. Freddie Wagand had broken open deep that time for Auburn era if they could have gotten it to him. No, right, exactly, Brian. He just did not release it. He couldn't pull the trigger. Here's third and nine. Fullwood's the tailback. Drills one to the sideline, and it is complete over there on the far side of the field. And that is Tillman. So a first.
first down for Auburn. The ball is at the 35-yard line. The freshman contributes. And this is their most impressive quarter of the day. And, of course, one of the major changes was at quarterback. With Berger driving them and hitting that third down pass, getting credit for another completion in the previous series. AG straight ahead, big hole to the 27-yard line. So this will be second and short. And this is where Pat Dye likes to keep his running team is second and short. They're going to keep that ball on the ground, I think, and just march it out. That's their best, best bet. Now, the reason they're having such a good quarter is they're having a good offensive quarter. They're keeping the ball away from Texas A&M. Second and two. Jackson to the corner, inside the 20 to the 16-yard line, another Auburn first down. Berger did a good job on that play because he was forced very early and it was tough for him to shovel that ball out, but he did get it to Jackson. Good reaction on the option play. Watch right here. He takes the ball to A.G. and just pitches it out beyond Bryant, who was dogging, and good fielding by Bo Jackson, and he thrust right through for the first down. A year ago, Auburn was operating out of the wishbone attack. Now Jackie Sherrill must look at the eye, and that, of course, is to take advantage of Bo Jackson's skills. They run that sprint draw, and Jackson is stopped at the 15-yard line. Larry Kelm, 65. They're the meeting for the Aggies. Auburn trailing by five, but driving. Inside of a minute, third quarter. And the Tigers have dominated here so far in this second half. Here's Fullwood, who is checked in, breaking free with a second effort, and he's across the 10 yard line. It's a muscular Auburn team. We saw this kind of a drive in the fourth quarter against Alabama. Exactly the same type of drive. Staying on the ground, muscling the ball. Good, good second effort here. And he comes out where they've got, what, third and about two. This is third and two, and the 14th play in this series. The short man, straight ahead. Reggie Ware, who was operating out of that set, along with Fullwood, and the officials will call a timeout here and make sure that they get a proper measurement. Five seconds up on the clock before we will start the final quarter of what has been a very entertaining Cotton Bowl game. He's got it. Well, that possession time was really... Watch the left tackle right here, which is Steve Wallace, 78. But doesn't get the job done. And that's the end of the quarter. 15 minutes of the 50th annual Cotton Bowl Classic left. Five-point game. We'll be right back. This time he's just inside the two-yard line. Era, Auburn is doing what you said they had to do. Exactly. Maintain possession of the ball in that third quarter. They had it 11 minutes and 49 seconds to AM's 3-11. And you can't generate much of an offense for that. That's exactly what they had to do. And they've done it in the third period. Whether or not they can do it in the fourth, that's yet to see. Kyle Collins checks in with the play. It's second and goal. Just a little longer than two yards for the touchdown. Jackson is stuffed that time. Todd Howard, number 73, led the Aggie defenders into that hole. This will make it a third and goal from the two-yard line. which 
has yielded two touchdowns to Bo Jackson today from five yards, 73 yards on a pass, determined to stop Auburn here. In the Alabama game, it, was, it took Auburn to the fourth down, and they just barely made it to their fullback, where I believe, going over the middle. Let's see what happens here. Jackson is tripped up. He was going to go airborne. And nose guard Sammy O'Brien was the first to get to a foot. Boy, he really tries to get in here, but the defense of Texas A&M is doing a great job at the goal line. You can see with the fullback, A.G. just dives over the pile. If he'd had the ball, he'd have made it. It is fourth down. 13 minutes to go. Auburn trailing by five points. The War Eagle watching on. The Cotton Bowl could be coming down to this play. They will have to call a timeout because only six seconds remain on the 30-second clock. Berger to the sidelines. Auburn is slow in getting its plays out there. Back and from the shadow of the end zone, you can see the AM defenders exhorting the 12th man up in the stands to give them all the help they can. And Auburn will have to concentrate at that line of scrimmage to get this play called, Coach. I wonder whether or not they'll take a chance and go to the option play, which is very difficult to defend at this point. That's A.G. 30. Jackson 34 won't get it. Larry Kelm, 65, left the defenders in, and they stopped the Heisman Trophy winner. from behind the defense keeping an eye out for 34 and ever so quickly it was Kelm who slashed in there and got a hand on it first down AM hands the ball to Anthony Tony their senior fullback and they will start to attempt a time consuming drive one more look here at that play great again you can't you can't say enough about this Texas A&M defense rising to the occasion here when they were challenged at the goal line Kelm was the first to get in there and then he got support from the rest of that Aggie team and coach it is second and eight Aggies leading by five and it's Tony again from the eye formation they used the short man and Harold Hallaman the nose guard for Auburn stopped it well, it may have been justice in that particular drive or that uh, failure by Auburn on the basis of that one play in the middle of the field, which was really should have been called back and, and forced into a punt. That was a third and eight, and Berger stepped over the scrimmage line and was credited with a completed pass that kept the drive going. Now there's some confusion for a but the extra player gets off the field in time. On this third down, Murray throw from his own end zone and complete to Duncan Webb. What a big play by the Aggies coming out as Kevin Murray coolly steps back in his own end zone and nails his tight end. Boy, a gutsy play here by Murray. He finds Webb crossing wide open here. Everybody's chasing instead of being in front to react to the ball. And it's a first down. Big play. And the young man will return to guide the fortune of the Aggies. Applauding that 11-yard gain. He's 13 of 23. 200 yards passing on the day. Running Tony and Rocker rocks him. Well, it's not for the national championship, but it's been a good one, hasn't it? It really has been a great football game. And there's still a lot of it left with 11 minutes, 11 minutes left. Second down and eight. I don't think I would disagree with the choice of Dye to go for it down there because he would I'd say, okay, I want that lead if I can get it. If I don't, I'll leave the ball at the one-yard line for him. But Murray bailed him out and has brought him out to the 20. Nelson in motion. 
they will pitch to Johnson. Johnson nimbly got around that corner and out close to the 25-yard line. Kevin Porter was there and the Auburn offensive players watching from the sideline, wanting to get the ball back with time running down. You know, when you look at this 8-3 and three record, Pat Dye and Auburn this year, they lost to Tennessee. They did not play well at all, and Dye is the first to admit it. But they were beaten late by Florida, 14-10, and then they lost the heartbreaker to Alabama. The common denominator, all had outstanding quarterbacks who beat Pat Dye and Auburn. There's another one operating right now. Kevin Murray on third and three for the Aggies. Back to throw it. Could not run out of trouble. Number 74, Tracy Rocker, bringing him down, and that will force a punt right here. A big defensive play. It really was. They had man-to-man -man coverage underneath with deep secondary and zone. It worked for him that time because Murray had to run the ball on the inside, and the line got it. So the punt will come off the foot of Todd Chance and Trey Gaines. Gaines is about due for a return. He's been very steady during the year. Another member of the Auburn baseball team has it at the 40. Trying to come free. And he is out of bounds across the 50-yard line. Auburn is 49 yards away from scoring. A 12-yard return by Trey Gaines. We'll be right back. Thoughts? <laughs> no, actually, uh, Bud Light. So if you want the less filling light beer with the first name and taste, ask for Bud Light. Yours? No. Because everything else... Give me a light. Showtime! It's just a light. Well, there are Auburn's last two drives. They went 12 plays. They went 18 plays. They got a field goal out of the two, but they dominated the clock. They're coming back with Bo Jackson, and he was slammed by Mueller. Those two drives, Coach. They got a field goal out of the one, and of course, you saw what happened on that 18-yard play drive. They failed at the two-yard line on fourth down, but look at the time they had that ball. And that last hit was about as hard as Bo Jackson has been hit all day. Second and ten. Berger, with time, goes to Parks. Parks is down inside the 40-yard line. That'll be close to a first down. Johnny Holland was the linebacker who had coverage on the tight end. Ball was thrown very low, but I think Jeff Parks did a fine job at fielding it. You see right here, Berger gets plenty of time this time. Ball is real low. Great catch by Parks. Nice job. Just short of the first down. Third and short, and Reggie Ware has the first down for Auburn. You know, a diving catch of a low-thrown ball has to bring back a sort of an unhappy memory for you when Cotton Spire here of the Longhorns did in the Irish that year. Exactly right. Fourth down and two right down this left-hand corner. And uh, Streeter hits Spire for the big play that maintained possession of the ball in Texas Peters in that first ball game. First down for Auburn, and the ball is at the Aggies' 35-yard line. Berger to toss it to Jackson, who was flaring, but the coverage man was Holland outside. Boy, nice job by Holland. He covered out there to the wide side. He has great speed. Came to Texas A&M as a quarterback, believe it or not. Now an All-American linebacker. And watch him come right out here. Berger drops the ball off to Jackson. Here comes Holland in the picture. Clear from his inside strong linebacker position to make the play for a loss. Well, I guess maybe no game. Jackie Sherrill's defense had Domingo Bryant blitzing that time. He got in between the passer and Jackson. Holland went outside with Jackson. Now they'll run go again, trying to get around. He busts the Sadler tackler, and there is you-know-who. And now in the second half, Johnny Holland has come to life. He is Johnny on the spot right now. This will be a tough call here. It's been a 
big difference in the first half and the second half by the rushing of the two teams. You see there the great play of Holland and Domingo Bryant in this ball game. Jackson up the middle, squeezes it down to the 27, short of a first down, and number 11 is right there to meet number 34. Two All-Americans clashing right now. Faced with that fourth down and short again. This will be fourth and two. Wouldn't you be tempted if you were Pat Dye to use Jackson as a decoy in a situation like this, Earl? Well, yeah, they'll probably be key. They're keyed on him. They've got to come up with something a little different. Here comes the goal line defense. Basil Jackson's in again, Brent. He is a great freshman linebacker at Texas A&M. Here's Jackson. He will not get it. The Aggies were there. Wayne Asbury, the cornerback, came up. He was amongst the first to get a lick on Bo Jackson. What a defensive performance the Aggies have put on in these last two efforts. Not since 1968 have the Aggies come into the Cotton Bowl game. That day, they upset Alabama. They were an underdog when this game started against Auburn. But right now, they lead it by five. And we'll be back for the last six minutes in a moment. Hey, I see Jim Nance with a yell leader from Texas A&M. Let's get out of the field. Jim? Fred, I'm with Thomas Buford, who is the brother of Maury Buford, the punter for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Thomas, you are the head yell leader here. How important has this crowd been today? Jim, I tell you. You can't say enough about the 12th man. They have come They've come alive during the SMU game at home at Kyle Field, the Arkansas game, the Texas victory, and right here today. And I tell you, they're great, and I love them. I love being an Aggie. All right, thank you very much, Thomas. Let's go back upstairs. All right, Jim, thank you. And his Aggies have got a first and ten. They lead the Cotton Bowl by five. And now on the pitch, it is Roger Beck. Slashing back inside to the 30-yard line. Did you hear what that yell leader said? He was the brother of Maury Buford. He's a great punter with the Chicago Bears. And he's probably watching this Cotton Bowl right now. And we'll see him, of course, Sunday in Soldier Field. He'll handle the punting for Mike Ditka against Bill Parcells and the Giants. Giants turned in some kind of an effort, didn't they, against the San Francisco 49ers. We'll see how Joe Morris does against that Bear defense. Second down and eight yards to go. Murray... Over the middle, you know who, Bernstein, and Bernstein to midfield, 45, 40, 35, and he's down to the 33-yard line. Another 37-yard reception by Rod Bernstein of Bryan, Texas. for 108 yards by the tight end today, Era. He'll delay in here, and then he'll come underneath. He hides, and then Murray dumps the ball off to him beautifully. And what a job he does for the tight end. A 235-pound run on the football. Clock is inside the five-minute mark. That is Pick pounding straight ahead behind the Aggies' offensive line. Some of those men up front, Doug Williams, of course, the All-America right there, 75, opening the way. Randy Dawson, 64, next to him. Matt Wilson, 50, is the center. Randy Wiley, 58, he's the left guard. And Luis Cheek, out of Fairfield, Texas, is over there at the other tackle spot. Nice distribution of yardage for both Tony and Vic. Tony has 61 yards. Vic has 66 from that fullback position. AM will use its first time out. Murray was somewhat confused. He was looking over at the sideline, and he wisely elected to use a timeout rather than have something go wrong. We'll be right back. I've got a headache. Bit. Here is the first devastating block thrown. It is Vic coming downfield. He will cut right in front of Woodside, and he will take Jonathan Robinson completely out of the play right there at the 24-yard line. Then Woodside cuts upfield, 
Thompson joins him down there, and he was the player who was shaken up when he stuck his head in front of a defensive back. But that has given the Aggies a first and goal at the four, and Kevin Murray on the afternoon, 15 of 25 for 284 yards. Aggies lead by five. Johnson in motion. Vick behind the right side. He's stuffed by that Auburn defense. Jackson, who has rushed for 127 yards, caught another pass, 73 yards for a touchdown here this afternoon. His final game playing for Auburn, matched against Jackie Sherrill, who has come here from Pittsburgh and four years later has a chance to win a Cotton Bowl. The first time the Aggies have been in the Cotton Bowl since 1968. And the whistle sounded. The whistle was blown as Murray rolled around. There was a penalty flag down, and the whistle sounded. Celebration continues, but there was illegal procedure and no touchdown. And Pat Dye gets a reprieve. So in a way, it is teacher against student, because back in the early 60s at Alabama, when Pat Dye was coaching the linebackers, the man across the field, Jackie Sherrill, was one of his players. Paul Bear Bryant was the head coach. Both men influenced so much by the Bear. And how ironic it is that the Bear lost to Texas A&M the last time they played in the Cotton Bowl back in 68. Touchdown of the afternoon. Well, I guess that penalty allowed the Texas A&M team to go with their stronger suit after having scored on that little two-way. I thought to myself, well, that penalty might hurt them, and I thought, no. Murph gives Murray the chance. He's got to be awful happy with both sides of the ball, the offense and the defense. Here's a look at it from a side. You see Murray come right back into the pocket. There's Woodside breaking right to the right of the screen. Takes an out pattern. Nobody's there. No coverage on him. And that was the touchdown. Woodside's had quite an afternoon. Here is Kevin Murray, the quarterback, who has led this assault. Hitting Woodside in the corner, Jackie Sherrill. And now they work the swinging gate, and they get the two-point conversion. Coach Sherrill has taken a 29-16 lead. Here in the Cotton Bowl, it is 29 to 16. And Bo Jackson, watching from the other sideline, getting up for one more chance. It'll be the 12th man coming downfield. As the swinging gate puts two more points on the board, it's 29 to 16. students Bullwood will down it back in the end zone and the ball will come out to the 20 yard line after the touchback turned in some electrifying moments in this cotton ball. On both sides of the ball, the offense obviously, particularly in the first half where they had almost 300 yards, but the defensive goal line stand that would have given Auburn the lead was, to me, the key series in this football game for the Texas A&M Ball Club because they would have fallen behind in the ball game. Of course, anything can happen with that kind of a situation. Running 
the draw. Tommy Agee, the fullback. And he is out of bounds at the 29-yard line. James Flowers, 15, taking Agee out. And the Auburn career of Bo Jackson coming to an end. The final two minutes. Three wide receivers spread to the right. Berger back to throw. Intercepted. Domingo Bryant down at the 10-yard line. The big play man has intercepted his second pass of the game. And all those years of frustration by Aggie fans coming to an end on this New Year's Day in the Cotton Bowl. Going over to the far sideline, Trey Gaines was the intended receiver, and just as he has done all year, Domingo Bryant was right there where the football was. And the short man right straight ahead is Anthony Tony to the five-yard line. 1.30, and AM about to win this 50th Cotton Bowl. Domingo Bryant has really played a heck of a football game out here. He's been all over the field. He has supported the run. He's been in perfect position on the passing game. He's picked off two balls. Down to the two-yard line with Tony. away and Jackie Sherrill Texas A&M winning the Cotton Bowl over Auburn and Bo Jackson from the full house Tony stopped by the right side of that Auburn defense Elliott has been a wildly exciting Cotton Bowl game. It really has. And there is the man with, that's had a sensational career. Well, this is the end of one career, but the beginning of another. <laughs> R.C. Slocum, the defensive coordinator, embracing head coach Jackie Sherrill, and Texas A&M busts in again. Anthony Tony. Thirty-five to sixteen. This time they swing back. Instead of going for the two, Slater will kick the one. 36-16. It's over in Dallas. We'll be right back. 